Good afternoon, everybody. It's Friday, the 4th of December. You're here at Lunch and Learn. Uh, we have uh, part two of the uh, series uh, we're doing on home remote and telehealth training. Today, uh, we're joined by Dr. Tina Buck and her colleague, Steve Parent. We're trying to get Steve Parent up on the line, but Tina's here to start, um, and you can see her screen. Tina's uh, is board certified in neurofeedback, as you saw from the brief introduction we typed up about her work. And she's worked with a lot of folks using neurofeedback at home and, and speaking with uh, the new mind team offered to do this training. So she's in a, what I did on Wednesday, guidelines and overviews. She's gonna go into more detail about, you know, methods and the appropriate ways to work with patients. So without any further delay, Tina, it's all yours. Thanks for being with us today. All right. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be presenting today. This is a, a lot of uh, background goes into this, and uh, especially want to thank Richard and Rob for, for allowing me to do this today and with Steve. So I also want to thank uh, Lori Miller and Glenn Marks for the inspiration to move forward with this project. And I want to acknowledge those frontline workers who have been working in the offices and condolences for lost loved ones and clients during this time. It's a, a very different time in our world. And, um, you know, here we are moving to a home user platform is uh, it's really different for a lot of people. And so what we bring to the stage here is a lot of background, a lot of experience. And also the, I love that ISNR just put out the standards for home use because that's critical that we have professional and responsible use of home equipment. And I can't stress that enough. Um, kind of scary to think about people getting a hold of systems and what they can do with them to themselves without the correct supervision. So a little bit more on my background. Um, I wanted to introduce also Steve Parent. He'll be coming in a little bit later, but I um, Learned neurofeedback on a 486 computer back in 1993 through an extended University of Arizona course. And my mentor all these years has been Bob Crago. And um, I learned on an F1000 and Lexicore and that kind of thing way back. And I followed the trends of neurofeedback. And I'm, again, really excited to be here at this point where hopefully we're at a juncture now where we can have responsible use of home equipment going out and the supervision available through a lot of professionals in the field. It's just a new day. So the guidelines that we are setting out, we've developed a 10 hour training program. And so this is an overview of the basics today that I'm gonna go over, but the overall picture of responsible use of home equipment, um, our ethics and risk management being key informed consents and using checklists so that there's agreement, assessments of the client, again, is this a client that's appropriate for home use or not, Techni uh, technology, whether or not their technology matches the hardware software that's being used, and also the environment that they're doing their training in. Uh, we, I've learned that education of clients is key. It is key for instilling client confidence. I tend to over-educate and that just gives them the ability to move forward with confidence to hook up their brains. And then technical support. Oh my gosh, I am not technical at all. And so having technical support has been key, but it's also key for client uh, support, customer service, and to keep things moving forward because remote home training is a different clientele. These people tend to be more demanding, more entitled in a sense. They've really researched, they've looked and tried to find the best way to get the most out of equipment, out of time, et cetera. So it's a, it's a different day than bringing somebody into the office and training them and sending them home. Not that that isn't part of this, this talk, but I, I, I think moving to remote home training is a large intention behind this presentation. And then client motivation and retention. It's hard to motivate clients. Judy covered that the other day. And retaining clients, there's a lot to that. Online listening, it's a different world. Again, we don't get all of that energy and interchange of the, the um, body language of a client in the office. And then tracking pro progress is really key 
And that's where I've learned that I, I think I have some gifts there that I've learned how to train other people to work with because when you don't have that client with you, um, there's a lot behind the scenes to figure out how to get that the information out of them about their progress because it's hard enough in the office as we all know. Marketing, ethical marketing and referrals and then professional development, protocol selection, you know, staying on top of the game moving forward with the industry is key. Confidence, I can't stress enough, the clients who are home users, in my experience, need confidence more than anything, because after all, they're hooking up their brains. And I tell people, I don't care who you are, if you're a neuro neurologist, if you're a physician, if you're an attorney, I don't care who you are, if you're going to be hooking up your kid, you need that um, confidence to overcome the unspoken fear of brain training. And that unspoken fear is really about the loss of control. You know, we've all heard it. Oh, is this going to change my personality? Or um, is this going to make me grow green hair? You know, people get scared about their brains. And they don't want, they don't know. They're going to ask, so what is it doing? And so it's important to be prepared with metaphors and training materials. At the ISNR, um, YouTube is excellent for some background information about what neurofeedback is. Sometimes I'd even have them read uh, the symphony in the brain before I'd ever send out equipment so that that would help with that process of confidence and then emphasizing no energy comes into the brain. You know, that's a, a as we all know, but again, with home users at a distance, they need that confidence to know that you know what you're doing and you're going to empower them to know what they're doing. At the first contact, uh, there's a lot that can be addressed and I really encourage people not to use online inquiry forms, uh, not to not use them, but to not rely on them for the whole picture. You really need to talk to people. It's kind of a lost art, <laughs> but it's coming back. And uh, connecting at that first contact, really connecting with your clients from a distance is an art. And assessing the conditions that they want to address for themselves and their family members, the expectations that they have, and really giving them reasonable expectations, not making any promises and deciding how they communicate. Everybody has different communication styles. Some people I can tell from that first conversation that they are not a good communicator, they're not a good historian, and unless there's somebody else in the home with them that can be their witness, they're probably not gonna be a good client for home use. So communication style, how, they, uh, how often they get back with me, how they communicate in the written word, how they communicate in the spoken word, tells me a lot about the eligibility. And then the other thing, again, is satisfying their abandonment spheres. Customer service is a lost art in so many ways, and we need to bring it back for especially this clientele. Um, what I did was I always worked a job. I do a lot of um, risk assessment in hospitals, and I, I always told people I'd get back with them within 15 minutes by text. And then as soon as I was free, I would be able to get back with them by phone if I needed to. And, you know, there are issues with that with HIPAA and um, I make sure that they understand that and sign for that agreement that they're okay with texting. That's um, something to cover. Anyway, the abandonment, their abandonment fears need to be satisfied that you know that you're, they're there for you, especially the first week or two. After that, you know, they don't want to hear from me because they're kind of sick of, of hearing from me by the point that I've satisfied those fears. And then instilling confidence, I've covered that quite a bit, cannot stress it enough. So the ethical issues are, of course, uh, standard to our industry and financial is one of the issues that I put first because if I'm leasing the equipment, then sometimes it changes the dynamic in that relationship with that client. What if they miss a payment? You know, then what? Then our relationship, our rapport might not, might be a little bit different. They might be afraid to contact me. And so I make sure that that's all in writing. They understand what their responsibilities are and how I'm going to contact them if there are any issues. And then informed consent does not change. And one of the things that I add for informed consent is that information might be covered or maybe on the server of the manufacturer uh, of the equipment and that they need to consent to know that that information may not be completely um, private. And if they want to fill out forms using alternative names, Mickey Mouse or whatever, they can do that. But I do get all of their information in their real name on record. Disclosure of risk, a lot of providers, I think, um, 
may or may not know about the Peniston flu, for example, and that there are two lawsuits that have been lost that I'm aware of in the neurofeedback field. One was a heroin addict that could no longer get high because he had done a lot of training, and it's one of the changes that can happen with, with substance use. And he won the lawsuit because he couldn't get high anymore. And then the other lawsuit was a psychic who couldn't use her abilities in the same way anymore. So I tend to be really careful on disclosure of risk and let people know that they're responsible to contact me if they have any side effects, et cetera. And then client goals, I make sure that those are clear. I'll go over that a little bit more. And client support, that that's in place. Uh, if I'm on vacation, who do they reach, et cetera. And then I want my clients to know that I want them to do a minimum, minimum of 20 sessions, that that's in my initial package. Because otherwise, if they're, oh, I just want to do a couple of uh, sessions and see how it goes, it doesn't do our, our, our field any good, and it doesn't do them any good to just try it. They really need to be committed. And then credentials, we want to make sure that the credentials of people who are using the equipment are appropriate, and typically a master's level person is going to be informed on informed consent and mandatory reporting, et cetera. And then on the legal side of things, of course, HIPAA and using a HIPAA compliant EMR and, and releases of information for any other members of the uh, client's team that they're working with. I had a list of about 19 issues on agreements. And the agreements means I understand that if I use aspartame, it could alter the results of my neurofeedback, for example, and that they agree to get back with me within uh, you know, that they, they agree to let me know if they're having any side effects and that they understand how I'm available. So I put all of that in writing and I have them sign for it but before I ever send out the equipment. Um, make sure that there's communication style, that they agree to communicate once a week with a session, um, that they communicate with me regularly about their progress and lack of progress, any side effects, et cetera. Boundaries that are in place for my time, that was really important because some home users don't necessarily want to read everything and figure it out. Um, we need to give them appropriate training so they don't have to, but at the same time, I don't want to spend you know, 20, 20 uh, hours a week on one client because they aren't empowered to, um, to use the equipment properly and understand what they're doing and the effects and why. So those boundaries are clear at the beginning. Crossing state lines is really important to understand the ethics around that. I actually also got approached by a provider who had a home or a, an office in a state, and he accused me of encroaching on his territory. So that was quite interesting. So some people get fussy about that, and I just like to make sure you know that, you know, because I work with people nationally and in, in Canada. Um, the other thing is noticing the difference between counseling and coaching with a remote home training model. I prefer coaching. And then if they need a, a local counselor, then making sure that that's in place before I send the equipment out that they've actually um, established rapport with somebody if they, have, if they don't already have a counselor or a therapist on, on board. And that especially for uh, trauma and for addictions and for grief and loss or other adjustment issues. And then a whole harmless agreement. I had one of those for the equipment manufacturer to make sure that that was covered legally. And I had an, a, an attorney cover all of that with me. I went through it with them. So risk management is key. Cover yourself. Make sure those consents and disclosures and agreements are all in place. And don't gamble with your license or lawsuits. You know, just cover the bases. Checklists are really important so that there's that agreed on, yes, we've covered this. Yes, I, I agree that I've, we've covered this information. And then the backup uh, training materials and support if, um, if anything goes wrong. So having all of that agreed on was important. And of course, that last note, protocols are non-transferable and really, really educating clients about what neurofeedback is, what it isn't and why it's not transferable is important. So when it comes to a distance evaluation, I prefer to call it a functional evaluation because I'm not getting a brain map. I'm not getting that um, direct data so much. And there are some other factors that go into that that, are, that I need to address up front, one being the client intention. You know. One of the things I ran into a lot with parents, especially uh, parents of, of 
older children with addictions, their adult children with addictions, is they're trying to fix their kid. Well, that doesn't work in a distance model. I want to talk to that adult child and get, I need to understand what their intention is. And if they're just going along with it, it doesn't typically work. And I work really hard to get the parent who's pushing the issue to do their own training. I actually had one, her son went to treatment. The treatment center adopted neurofeedback to work with her son. And she did about 60 sessions herself <laughs> to deal with her own codependency. And she came out the other side of that so empowered. It was beautiful. But those situations aren't real common, you know, because the, the fixer parents, are um, sometimes the last ones that want their brains dealt with. And so I really watch for that. And then the technology assessment is important. That's where Steve uh, can really help with that because the person's home computer might not have the right speed or whatever. Uh, again, this is not my area. And that's, and that's where Steve has been invaluable. And doing a home conditions assessment um, I remember working with a client who was dealing with some domestic violence in the form of verbal abuse. She didn't benefit very much because she, her brain was always on edge. You know, she was in a dangerous situation in, in the way that her brain functioned. And so home conditions with children, are there, is there a safe place? Is there a room where somebody can relax into their alpha theta session without interruption, et cetera? And then I want to get a really good history of what brought them to this point. Um, I've worked with actually many people, I would say, with complex PTSD, but they already did a ton of work. They'd already done a whole lot of EMDR. They already had their lifestyle and their support system in place. They already had all of that. And so assessing all of that, I can't rule out somebody with complex PTSD, but I can make referrals if they're not appropriate right now and encourage them to pursue it uh, with, with another provider that's more local, et cetera, more connected. Um, support, their support system for people with addictions. They need that 12-step or other support system that helps their brain to recognize that they are, that their hurting instincts are satisfied, and that they're not alone in the world, that it's not just a neurofeedback, but there's so much more to it in a holistic model that they need in order to be successful. And assessing the lifestyle. And this is so important, what they're eating, how many times a day they're eating, um, what, what they're drinking, how much caffeine they're consuming, whether or not they're getting exercise, what kind of exercise, and sleep, sleep, sleep. You know, what are their issues with sleep and breaking that down very carefully into the different areas of sleep, such as sleep onset, how long, how many times a night they're waking, how long they stay awake once they're woken. Are they obsessing? You know, what are the many different issues that go with sleep so that I have that as a baseline? And typically the issues that, um, that I work with with home users that are so obvious are sleep, attention, and mood, and then other areas on top of that. But those tend to be the easiest to track with clients to show their progress. And then the other thing about home users, just like in the office, is they're going to over-attribute or under-attribute their symptoms to neurofeedback. If they're getting better, oh, it's because I got a new job. I mean, we've all faced that. And so that's why I want to get really good baseline measures of where they're starting from so that I can really track with them what their progress is. And the issue with over-attributing is if I have somebody in a family who's so much, somewhat obsessional or very obsessional, then there might be contagion in that family. Oh my gosh, little Susie had this happen. Therefore, I think it also happened to you know, the other children. So education and alleviating the fears is important that way, but also assessing in their communication style, kind of where they go, what way they lean with that. So one of the ways with tracking there each system each you know type of neurofeedback system out there has its own tracking method and with a home user model i really keep i, I keep track mentally and also in records what their baseline measures are in some key areas like i was saying sleep mood and attention tend to be big keys and I want to get really accurate baselines of the frequency that something happens. How many times a day or a week does that happen? 
not usually more than that unless it's maybe an, a migraine. But I really want to be able to track weekly what's going on with changes. And then the frequency, so the intensity on a scale of 1 to 10, how intense. So if somebody has anxiety, uh, how, how often are they having peaks in their anxiety a day or a week? So if they peak at an eight or nine, how many times a day does it peak at eight or nine? And then how many times a week, for example, are they having more of a panic attack? Um, you know, panic attacks is a whole other issue. There's a whole training just on that and dealing with people who have a history of panic attacks, but I won't go there now. And then the duration, how long does the anxiety last at you know, that intensity level? And then maybe what is their resting level? I say resting. What is their average level of anxiety throughout the day and throughout the week. So maybe their average is three, and then twice a, a day it peaks at an eight, and maybe once a week it'll go to a 10. So I wanted those details, and that way I can watch those in a detailed way. I can review that with the client every time and watch those go down. And then percentage percentages is something that's not as accurate. Um, some people are not uh, able to really nail down. You know, they're so contextualistic in their thinking that they, you know, in the thought process that they, they aren't able to really nail down numbers. So then I might say, well, what percentage of the week do you say that you feel anxious? And they might say, oh, 80% of the time. So then we can watch that percentage go down over, over time. And that person may not be as good of an historian, so I want other markers in place as possible. And then having witnesses available. A witness would be a, a, a spouse, a, a neighbor, a coworker, somebody who might be a better historian, a better witness to that person's progress or their symptoms as they go through the week. And one other thing I've learned is to tell clients to look at their eyes in the mirror before and after a session. It is so cool to do that because you can see the presence coming back. You can see kind of the light coming back in a person's eyes when they leave. We know what it looks like in the office, but if we can train clients to do that at home, they can see their own progress. Even if they can't see it in other ways, they could go, huh, isn't that interesting? Because it's hard to deny what that looks like. Um, so people will, of course, but it is hard to deny. So training materials, oh my gosh, um, most systems have really great training materials out there, but they aren't necessarily training materials for the home user in as much detail as I would prefer. And so I created some of my own training materials and checklists to go through. And there are different, different learning styles, of course. So having video, having images, having pictures, having a manual that's step-by-step -step with clear instructions, um, what I would typically do is send out the video before the equipment arrived. I would have the, the client watch it twice before the equipment arrived. Then I would do the connection with them and work with them over a couple of hours' time. It's pretty intensive. You know, it's intimidating to them. The hardest part is getting the connections. Of course, that's their, their fearful part because now they're hooking up their brain and am I going to do it right? And it's a little awkward and it takes dexterity. So there are a lot of tips to training people on how to connect themselves at home. One of the other keys is having them, uh, if you're if you're on the fly and you don't have time to connect by Zoom or, or a platform, you can also have them take a picture and send it to you. Did I put this in the right place? Um, I had a client who had a, had a head injury. She was in her 70s, and she took she uh, had her grandson shave a place on her head so that she knew where to put her electrodes. Well, her hair covered the rest, and nowadays with Zoom, who would know anyway, right? So there are little tricks like that to to making sure they get good connections at the right locations and using checklists to make sure that they understand, you know, to check for impedance and all that kind of thing as they go through. Um, and that's where I follow up the first couple of days pretty regularly. I'll go on with them a couple of times. I'll let Steve talk more about that because he's actually more of an expert at it than I am. So one other thing is that when it comes to connections and home user systems, most manufacturers do not have the time or the resources to be taking calls from home users about whether or not they got their connections right or their impedance right or did I do this right or that right. 
So in all of my written materials, I made it clear clients are not to contact the manufacturer for support. They are to contact me as the first line of support. And then I always had Steve for a backup who could assess the situation more carefully. And then if we needed to get the manufacturer involved, we could. So there was a line of support that the clients were clear on what what came first and it was their responsibility first to walk through steps and sometimes they're you know they don't have the time or they don't want to make the time and that's where being non-judgmental and just you know being firm but giving them support at the same time as they move into that confidence um, it, confidence sometimes comes more slowly for some than others but making sure that we hold them accountable is important too and then um, there, I saw this this morning on USA Today in April, there was an article that came out with the top 10 highest risks for online issues for home, uh, for working from home. The fourth highest risk for online trolling are tech support searches. So if you're going into Google and looking for tech support, um, that's where trollers or, or hackers are going to be looking for you. So be careful with that and make sure you've got tech support in line or that, um, you know, somebody local, somebody online, we certainly offer that through our services. So I'll turn that over now to Steve. Thanks, Tina. Um, I also want to say hi to everybody and thank you to Dr. Suter and everyone at New Mind. Um, everyone I've talked to over there has been terrific and I've been really impressed with the uh, the product, uh, both hardware and software. And also thanks to Rob and his colleagues for their great work on the ISNR guidelines. Looks like quite an opus. I'm sure it was a, uh, a lot of work getting that done. And thanks to all the attendees for letting us present some information about our workshop coming up in January. Um, we worked very hard on packing a boatload of information into about 10 hours. It'll probably go over, um, but there's a lot of stuff in there. And we're gonna, I'm gonna just talk for a couple minutes here about tech support and how it relates to client retention, because let's face it, you, you can't change the world if you can't get and keep clients. Um, so that's what we're gonna talk about. So tech support, certainly not the sexiest of topics, but I think you'll see that tech support affects many areas of your practice. Um, it's more than just, hey, what button do I click on? In fact, in Wednesday's talk, Rob mentioned common challenges to home remote training. And he said the number one challenge is trainee compliance. And I couldn't agree more with that statement. Um, in my experience, one of the main contributors to home users not training is being uncomfortable with the equipment, whether they realize it or not. Um, and that speaks to Tina's earlier slide about unconscious fears. It's not just loss of control, there's other things as well, including fear of the equipment, which they may not be aware of. So getting you, the provider, confident is key. In fact, confidence is one of the most important qualities for a successful neurofeedback practice, and that's in an office setting. And it's magnified several times over in the distance model. And what we'll do in the workshop is empower you, the provider, to have the confidence and be able to instill that confidence in the client as well. Because in the distance model, the client absolutely has to be sure of what they're doing. After all, they're suddenly expected to do part of your job that you would have done had you been seeing them in the office. And if you remember back to when you first got your shiny new high-tech neurofeedback equipment, it may have been a, a little intimidating, a little daunting. Now imagine the average client receiving the same device. You don't want them to be afraid of the equipment. And we'll show you how to overcome that. And that will add a lot of value to your practice and boost your reputation. A good, uh, good tech support and customer service definitely builds and maintains relationships, no doubt about that. Most, if not all of you are licensed, so you know how important good relationships are to protecting that license. In fact, customer service could even fall under the category of risk management for that very reason. Now, something you wanna be aware of, you know, there's a lot of things, but I'll mention a couple here. Something you wanna be aware of uh, when they start sessions, you wanna monitor their first few sessions whether it be Zoom, FaceTime, or a HIPAA compliant platform of your choice, uh, make sure they're placing the electrodes in the right spots, for example. You'd be surprised how to see how easily even a well-trained home user can mess things up. And I'll give you an example of that. Um, I was doing tech support for a very experienced provider who ha also happened to be an excellent trainer. So I knew going in that the client, the end user, was well-trained from the beginning. The client was having some side effects and connections, connection issues, 
and I wanted to watch her do a session because, you know, if a picture is worth a thousand words, the video is worth a million, especially in tech support. I think I used FaceTime at, at, on that call to help her out. So she set up her phone so I could see her doing the session. And she seemed to do okay. She was prepping the sites well, right amount of pace on the electrodes, everything looked good. Then I noticed something interesting. She was placing her active sensor 20% off in the 1020 system, 10, 20% off from where it was supposed to be. I mean, the sensor may as well have been in a different zip code and essentially she was doing a different protocol. So the point is monitor the few, first few sessions, maybe two or three if you can. I strongly advise that through video. And I would also advise um, do it every once in a while down the road, especially if they're having an issue uh, getting progress. They may be putting the sensor in the wrong place. You'd be surprised what can happen. Um, I think it's fairly safe to assume that everyone on this call is in this business because we like to help people. And we do that by training clients or having them train themselves as in the home remote model that we're talking about this week. And you don't need to become an expert in technology. In fact, why would you even want to be? Uh, that should not be your primary focus. Uh, it should be secondary. And the way that happens is if you're given the appropriate skills, confidence, and technology, and knowledge in that technology. But if you find yourselves needing additional support, there, that is something we can offer, whether it be coaching, mentoring, or additional tech support, something Tina and I can offer. Um, by providing good customer service, you'll get better baselines when setting up goals with clients, and you'll get to know the client well enough to notice subtle changes. You know, those subtle changes are sometimes even hard to notice in an office setting. And noticing subtle changes from a distance is a bit of an art form. So I'm gonna throw it back to Tina to chat about that a little bit, if you could, Tina. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, tech support is key. So absolutely, the monitoring things from a distance is different. And, and the home training client is different than an, than an office to home client too. So coaching is something, again, that I like to emphasize that I'm not doing therapy so much. I mean, I can do therapy with clients, but the coaching, because it's, and it's that shift from being a therapist to being a neurofeedback coach is it, a it's a bit different, but I think it really takes the stigma out of what's going on with clients to help them um, and empower them from that perspective. And that independence doesn't create dependence, right? So independence is a, a U.S. value. I mean, it's, a, it's part of our culture, and it doesn't mean that we can't. Uh, give support that's appropriate, but we want to give independence with confidence when it comes to neurofeedback equipment and home use. And I'll touch on this a bit more, but the motivation. I work with clients from the beginning about the motives and maybe what kind of um, what kind of rewards they can give themselves down the line after they've done so many sessions. And I try to keep them motivated by not having them do a session on one day a week. Most of my clients are doing sessions a minimum of three times a week, a lot of them twice a day. And the average client probably kept their system about four months. And in that time, I shoot for clients having at least 60 sessions. I mean, if you've got the equipment there, use it, right? But life has its own way of being. And time is something that people already are pressed for. So motivating clients to build into their, their daily routine, and like Rob said, with the standards from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., not after 6 p.m., not right before bed, you know, not the middle of the night, but doing it at an appropriate time, and then holding them accountable for their sessions, um, being there to support them, not judge them for not doing their sessions, but providing them the motivation, encouraging them with those original conversations about why they wanted to do their sessions. And that kind of customer service really adds into retention. We want to retain our clients and help them to complete the number of sessions they need to change their lives. And I think um, the noticing part is, and, and everybody has probably developed their own way of asking clients about their progress. I like to use the word notice. So what are you noticing? Rather than, well, what are you feeling? Because yeah, and at, at home, well, I'm feeling fine. I'm feeling good. Well, what does that mean? So using terminology that really interviews the client rather than 
seeing them, we're, we're getting that information in a different way. So noticing is the secret sauce and noticing when I'm hearing somebody talk, are they talking less, um, less quietly? Are they talking more quickly? Are they more present with the language that they're using? Are they not stalling as much between words? So all of that really pays off to listen. There are many different aspects of listening in an online world and developing those new listening skills is critical. That's something that I've, I've learned to teach and there are a lot of elements to it and it really is about noticing some, some quite delicate nuances in an online world that we don't have as a privilege in an office. And then I've already spoken about engaging the local witness to help with noticing. And then do your own training. It's so key because how can you take a client if you've only done 30 sessions yourself and you've got a home user cooking through, you know, two sessions a day or five sessions a week and they're pumping out a whole bunch of sessions and you haven't gone that far yourself, you're not going to be a good witness for the process. It's important for us to do our own work in this profession in order to understand so many elements <laughs> and then engage in ongoing education and mentoring. Our program is 10 hours long for transitioning and, and being a remote home trainer, but also we have mentoring in place. Um, there, there are a couple of people, one of them being Lori Miller, the other Bob Crago, both very seasoned professionals. They can also help with supervision. Um, not sure what other support is available through New Mind or other manufacturers. Um, but again, this is, this is a different world because without a map, if you're doing the map list, home training there there's um, lots of learning about how to supervise a protocol selection unless you're quite seasoned and dr Suter has put out a wonderful uh, youtube on the map list process so definitely look at that um, so i'm going to cover that at the very very end so capturing moments of clarity oh you know we we know them when we see them in the office that person walks in and we have a new client well, we want to hear that. We want to notice that. We want to listen for that and reflect it back at every opportunity we can when we're working in the remote setting. We want to give that client the encouragement to continue with their sessions and to help to witness and to notice their progress. And it is quite subtle. So then that takes me to families. Um, my best clients, I say best, I mean, I love all my clients, but the, the thing with families is that when a family trains together, they stay together. If we only work with the identified client, you know, the little six-year-old with attention deficit, um, well, what are the other elements of their attention? What else is going on in the family dynamics? And I know Dr. Suter really looks at that thoroughly as well, as many of the rest of you do. But um, from the very first call, when I speak to a parent, I assess whether or not that parent is willing to do their own training. And it's critical, well, they may not have time. Well, if you don't make time, you know, it's important for them to make their own time. And these are the key reasons. One is that it gives them the confidence when it comes to hooking up their child. If they've done several of their own sessions first, then they have the confidence to, to know what they're doing and hooking up their child. And it takes away that unconscious fear that then the child picks up like a sponge because it's their parent. And then comes the power struggle, right? So we want that parent to have the confidence to hook up their child in a timely way with confidence and get that session going quickly. And the other dynamic there is that uh, parents with parents of children with special needs have their own type of trauma track. You know, they've already been through a lot. And if they have several children with special needs, it's difficult. It's very difficult. And especially now with COVID, they're home with these children. They're having to school them and work and do so much more. So if that parent can make time, if, if there's, it's like 95% of me is like, they have to do their own training first. And that that's a, a pretty clear boundary. There have been exceptions I've made, but it's so important for that caregiver to do their own training. And then also for the spouse, if there's a spouse in the house, to, to do their training so that they understand as parents how to watch for those subtle changes in their children because they're so subtle. Children can't express to me as well. Sometimes they express better, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but um, those parents need to be able to recognize side effects also. And they need to understand what a side effect is and what it isn't and how to report 
uh, how to connect with me, how to communicate with me about those changes. Family packages are awesome. Um, I had a family of 10 in Oklahoma, and the the gal that looked me up uh, found me, and she hooked up her grandparents, her parents, her husband, and her siblings, and there were 10 of them all together. And she went around, and I think they averaged about 25 or 30 sessions. She kept the, set, the system for several months. And they had an amazing shift as an entire family. They lived in different places, and she would just go in and out of their homes and do their sessions with them, and that was so awesome. I had a mother of eight who adopted equipment twice. She took a break in between, and that can be really important for families that they don't spend their whole summer vacation doing neurofeedback together, you know, but that they take breaks. They maybe work a couple of months and then take a break, and that they have a day off together. And uh, family packages, I always gave discounts to the caregiver where I would give them a discount for the evaluation and their protocol selection and follow-up. And then the family packages can be, you know, can be packaged as a, as a unit and bring the cost down a little bit because once that parent is well-trained, your work is done uh, to a large degree. And then there are lots of tips for training children. I think you have about 25 tips for tra training children that it depends on the family and the way they process, but that is really key to give them some things to work with and to assess and to help them from the very first call on some of those issues. And one of the um, things that I do too is motivation for all family members is I, I really want the whole family to train when it's possible because it really does make a huge difference. And that motivation can come by setting a goal of, hey, after everybody's done the first five sessions, we're going to do this together as a family. After we've done 15 sessions, we're going to do this as a family. After we've done 20 sessions, you know, so they've got those rewards that the whole family will work together. And then they I have them put something up in their refrigerator that they can see their progress and that they work together to egg each other on to get their sessions done so they can get that reward. And it really helps. Um, so I make it a whole family affair, not just here's the equipment, go work with your kids, but really make it a part of their lifestyle for the time that they are working together doing neurofeedback. And then to come back, I've had several families bring, get the equipment uh, later on and, and continue their training at another level. And sometimes I've used other instrumentation as well. And it's really fun to, to work with families. I think that that's where the biggest changes are that I've seen in so many ways. Um, so then marketing, I'm going to move into that briefly. I have the Neurofeedback Home User. Um, Just a quick interruption, website. Tina. This is yes. Rob. Mm -hmm. um, you're you're yes. at about um, you know, eight minutes to the hour. Yes. I don't know if you wanted to take questions today or not. Just giving you sort of a time frame for you and Steve. Yes, this is uh, about the last slide, and I'm going to okay. wrap it up so we have a couple of questions. Thank you so much, though. Yeah, I'd like to really take some good questions here. So with marketing, I uh, want to make sure that you use non-diagnostic language, make no claims, and I use non-diagnostic language in my marketing materials all the way, and I, do, I refer to training versus treatment. We're doing brain training, like a coach would do um, training with somebody on a physical level. And I've got the Neurofeedback Home User website up. I've, I continue to get referrals from that that we'll be able to pass on to the people who go through our training program. And, you know, I think that that's the key kind of a breakdown is that this is really about self-regulation and optimization. And using that kind of terminology begins to shift the stigma associated with what we call mental illness. So again, these are the key, key areas that we'll be covering in our 10 hour weekend workshops. Um, I, I mentioned those all at the beginning and this is how you reach us and we are open for questions. Okay, well, it'll take us a minute to get everybody unmuted. We keep them muted so we can tape this. And so I'll just uh, start by saying uh, great information, uh, Tina and Steve. I think you cover a lot of incredibly important points and some of the, again, the challenges, the important uh, aspects of keeping, getting people engaged and keeping them involved in home training. Um, lots of good points here. Let me ask you both quickly. Are you available next Wednesday for Lunch and Learn for follow-up? I was hoping so, but I got a mandatory faculty meeting <laughs> for the university. 
I'm uh, available Wednesday. Um, Wednesday. Okay. Well, um, if that's okay with you, Steve, next Wednesday, we thought about just making it a follow-up discussion for anybody who's attended these to look at, um, you know, ways of uh, uh, other questions you may not get to today. So I'm going to back off and let other people ask questions. I'm assuming most of us are unmuted. And I'll be in touch with both of you and everybody here to, at today's session. We'll get you, uh, it'll be an announcement we make about day and time for follow-up. Great. Thanks, Go Rob. Ahead. Great. Thank gotcha. you. Thank you very much. Any one questions? Hey, this is Jordan. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes, yeah, Jordan. Um, one thing when you were talking about using um, video, which, oh my gosh, that's the biggest thing that has helped me when I work with home trainers and even clinicians. Um, one thing, if you don't have a, a video conference, system or anything like that something that i'll do um is that i'll have them use their computer's camera mm -hmm. as a mirror and that way they can you know if they need to they can take a screenshot to show me um just kind of making it easier for them to 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 show me and also show themselves where they're putting those electrodes absolutely right. that's a great point jordan Yeah, Jordan has a lot of experience in this area. I've loved talking with her. Uh, she's also been very inspirational for me. <laughs> so yeah, thank very you, helpful Jordan. for me too. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. I've of got course. some some kind of random tips and tricks that I've learned. Mm -hmm. I just want to say too that this doing home remote training really really broadens our ability to market and and it's so important that we have responsible use of equipment and responsible training and supervision of protocols but this market is wide open people are hungry for this and it's going to help shift so many families in so many wonderful ways to be able to have access I agree. As a matter of fact, before our meeting today, uh, Tina and Steve, I talked with somebody who was aware of neurofeedback and contact me because they're trying to get something going within their state to work with kids who were in various types of facilities. And as I've mentioned to this group here, I, I don't see people in person anymore, uh, given the, the virus and the pandemic at this point in time, especially in our state. But I do remote um, Training, and I have a technician at a facility who uh, runs the kids I used to work with and I used to go there in person and I get all that data coming back to the new mind system and then I can you know do conferences with them and all that so the other thing for people to think about is if they have uh, at some point in time opened up other clinics or satellite places where they do neurofeedback and it gets a little bit dicey with the pandemic that uh, this method is very useful for working with, you know, like a, within a school or a facility or an agency. Absolutely. Right. And intensive outpatient, intensive outpatient programs are also available through this that people could do their own neurofeedback, come together as a group. There's a whole model for that that can be delivered. That's great. Yeah. Well, we're close to the top of the hour, so <clears throat> I'll be in touch with um, both of you, and we'll uh, try to find a time that works if we have all three of us just do a, sort of a follow-up open discussion about remote training. I know from my presentation, uh, we ran out of you know time at the end of the hour, and, and Judy had other comments she wants to make. She does a lot of home training <clears throat> as well. So... Um, I'll be in touch with you uh, to plan that. So everybody, uh, as the plan looks right now, um, Monday night we will be reviewing a map, possibly next Wednesday doing a follow-up session to this. And next Friday, 
and I'll send up reminders on the listserv is a follow-up session with Dr. Turner with his presentation on his meds model and working with you know holistic health and neurofeedback. All of which again were covered in part that you know today in, in the presentation Steve and Tina did about you know sleep and diet and good sleep hygiene and exercise and all the things you want people doing. So thank uh, you so much, both of you, for taking your time. I know everyone's got busy schedules and it's a, just a crazy time of the year with the holidays and everything going on in the, in the world of health here. So we appreciate both of you so much for taking your time today. This will be recorded, uh, has been recorded, I should say, will be posted on the YouTube channel uh, probably within the next week or so. And we'll see everybody again Monday night. Thank you so much, folks. Appreciate it. Thanks, Rob. Very grateful. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Great Thanks job, Tina. Steve. Great job. Excellent. Yeah. Nice presentation, you guys. Really enjoyed it. Thank you.